Thanks everybody who's joined us. We'll get started here in a couple of minutes. Hi everybody, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight on this webinar. I'm very excited to have you all um, on this presentation. Uh, my name is Katie Davis. I'm the Associate Director of Wildlands Network. I'm based here in Salt Lake City, which is where our headquarters is located. Wildlands Network operates at the continental scale, working with partners in Canada, the US and Mexico to advance large landscape conservation and advocate for policy that will support the preservation of North American biodiversity for generations to come. I'm excited to bring together some amazing women tonight who will be speaking on the topic of collective action for conservation. Um, as we see it, the last few months have really brought home the importance of community response to what can seem like overwhelming problems. Like coronavirus, climate change and the collapse of global biodiversity cannot be mitigated or solved by one person, one organization or one country alone. Um, we live in an interconnected world, not just socially, but also ecologically. And the well-being of our human communities is intimately connected to the well-being of the natural world. It will take everyone working together to create a more sustainable future for both nature and humanity. And tonight we'll get to hear specific ways in which people have and continue to come together to work toward this shared vision and how you have the power to be a part of that. So let me introduce our speakers for tonight. Joining us from San Francisco, author Mary Ellen Hannibal, whose inspiring work has focused on telling stories of collective scientific action to support large scale conservation projects. On our most recent TED talk, she discussed the efforts of thousands of volunteers working to save the monarch butterfly, a project that can only be successful if, as she puts it, we do something for our commons together. Her book, Citizen, Scientist, Citizen Science, highlighted the numerous ways that everyday people lacking advanced scientific training are supporting conservation efforts. And her book, Spine of the Continent, highlighted a project that originated with the founders of Wildlands Network and is a vision of a continental wild way stretching from Alaska into Mexico protecting habitat for many of North America's most iconic species. Also joining us uh, here in Salt Lake City as well are Mary Pendergast and Janice, Janice, Janice Gardner, Ecologists for Wild Utah Project. Uh, Wild Utah Project provides science-based strategies for wildlife and land conservation here in Utah. The organization has supported numerous conservation efforts across the state by filling in the data and knowledge gaps about species habitat and movement data without which projects to restore landscapes and protect ecosystems would not be possible. Um, at the end of the presentation, we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. You're welcome to pose a question in the Q&A box at any time um, and we'll get to them at the end. 
And now I'd love to turn it over to Mary Ellen to speak about how she built her career as a nature writer and why she's drawn to the vision and potential of large scale conservation. Mary Ellen. Thanks a lot, Katie. Thanks so much, everybody. I'm really so um, pleased to be chatting with people today. It's, it's a huge consolation and um, consolidation of everything that we care about through, um, you know, in this time when we're confined to our rooms to connect together. So going back to how I got to the spine of the continent and the, the work of both um, the Wild Utah Project and Wildlands Network, it, it kind of really takes a one beginning moment in 2009 or a little bit before that when I, I wrote this book, Evidence of Evolution. These are muir eggs. And um, the muirs are seabirds that lay their eggs on the Farallon Islands. And they're in that pyroform shape because the islands are rocky and um, very precipitous. So if they roll, they don't fall off the cliffs. Um, so we can go to the next slide. This is the Xerxes blue butterfly. And um, both those muir eggs and this butterfly are from the collections at the California Academy of Sciences. This butterfly went extinct probably in the 40s, actually. Um, it had a relationship with an ant that was outcompeted when Golden Gate Park was made. Um, so it took a little while, but then the butterfly went extinct. And while I was researching evidence of evolution, um, you know, I was a science journalist and environmental reporter. And I was interviewing all these scientists at the academy and their taxonomists, they put species on the tree of life. They're not conservation biologists at all, really. Some of them are now, um, but they kept telling me, sure, I'll tell you how new life forms come into being, how evolution unfolds, but I have to tell you that, um, that there's a mass extinction going on. And I just, I didn't, I had never heard those words before. This was 2007 and eight when I was researching this book. Elizabeth Colbert's book, The Sixth Extinction came out in 2014. So that was a long way away. And I was finally, you know how you just have a moment where you see what's in front of you. And I was um, profoundly shaken when I realized they're telling me something I have to try to understand. So I set out to try to understand what is this extinction? What are they talking about? So the next slide, please. And, um, and I found out more about it. I said, oh, I've got to find a story to tell, uh, to help explain what's happening to species all over the earth um, in a way that is easier for people to digest. That's a narrative that's exciting and that's personal. And I found this amazing story. I mean, I've, I've been incredibly lucky because it's really lucky that I started with evolution because I find one of the things that's really in our way today is that people don't understand the basics at all about evolution or ecology. Even really smart people with PhDs and other subjects don't understand how life really works. And um, I wouldn't have known myself <laughs> if I hadn't written a book about evolution and then gone to the spine of the continent. So really the spine of the continent is profoundly really the, the creation story of Wildlands Network. And uh, the Wild Utah Project comes quite soon upon the heels of Wildlands Network and has been part of the spine of the continent initiative, which is, you know, as most of you probably who are listening in know, is a big network of nonprofits along the spine of the continent from Alaska down to Mexico, who, in addition to their own local work, are seeking to create connections between what they do with each other. So this is a great story, right? The spine of the continent, because, next slide, please. Um, this, this is a map, because of the concepts of really how nature works that are, are revealed through the spot of the continent and that nature includes humans, right? Like this is one of our fallacies that we can't kind of get our minds around. This is the interstate highway system. This is a very, you know, simplified map. There are millions more roadways on the, on the continent than this shows. But I like this map because it shows that our major interstate highways go from east to west. I understand from, you know, uh, road ecology people and biologists and conservation biologists that a lot of animal movement is north to south. 
So this is one way that we break up animal movement. And I think this is a very key way to explain the concept of connectivity to people who don't understand this, because pretty much everybody understands roadkill, right? You, this is a collision between humans and wildlife. Um, roads are a way in also for understanding profoundly what human, the breaking up of habitat is doing to our world in a way that has relevance right now with coronavirus, because we're not just breaking up the landscape on a kind of a flat 2D way. We're actually breaking up relationships that have uh, evolved over huge amounts of time. And so we are, we're imposing human time, which is I got to get to Salt Lake City in eight hours with, with um, historical biological time. And, and this is not working. Next slide, please. This is just an image of the night sky. Um, this is, probably, you know, a fraction of what it looks like now, although who knows what, maybe this is what it looks like now with coronavirus. We don't have as many people working all night long or flying through the night, but um, we even break up the night sky for species that are um, calibrating their life ways on the day and night cycle. So just even adding, it's almost hard for us to really grok this, right? Like not only are we breaking up time and space during the day in a horizontal way, but we're breaking up time and space in what I could call a vertical way through the whole cycle of day to night. So this is actually cosmic. And I think when we think of cosmic and just in the words of not, in the idea of not like extraterrestrial whatsoever, but actually terrestrial. <laughs> terrestrial um, coordination of cycles that we're all part of, this kind of much bigger cycle of movement. And this is what we're trying to grapple with is, is that the way that we interact on the planet is, is breaking these things up in a terrible way. Next slide, please. So here's Michael Soule. This, this slide is a couple of, it's more than 10 years old. So Michael's in his late seventies now. And here's this extraordinary person who I'm very fond of. And any of you who know him are too, I bet. Um, and he is the scientist who's largely credited with being the main founder of conservation biology. He certainly did not do that alone. Other big names like Paul Ehrlich, Jared Diamond, um, you know, all sorts of people helped and worked for years, E.O. Wilson, in recognizing that uh, the way that ecology or natural functioning was being treated the way that we were doing conservation had nothing to do with science. And science is a word that is, you know, kind of problematic for people. But in this case, science would mean like actually how do plants and animals live? Actually, what are their life cycles and what are their needs on the landscape? So Michael is, I tell this his story mostly in the spine of the continent. Um, I profile a lot of other people as well, but the, um, thing that remains extraordinary about him is his utter commitment to to uh, merging science into a larger context for regular people and um, he always said and still says that conservation biology is thank you Denise he's 83 oh my goodness he's not in his late 70s I'm forgetting that time is going by <laughs> I just talked to him last week too um, but uh, what, whatever I was saying is, uh, oh, that conservation is a mission-driven discipline. Now, you don't hear that even in medicine. What Medicine is a mission-driven discipline as well. They're trying to save people's lives. But uh, science doesn't like to call itself mission-driven, and he insisted on it. Next slide, please. This is Reed Noss. This is an old slide, too. These are beautiful photographs. These three photographs, or at least this one and the next one, were taken by Doug Tompkins, who um, those of you, some of you will remember, um, he died a few years ago, unfortunately, in a bad accident. But uh, he was a co-founder of Esprit, and he, found, and he funded Wildlands Network a lot, and then he turned his attention to buying land in South America. It's made a huge difference, and his, his widow is carrying that torch. Reed Noss deserves a lot more credit than he generally gets. Um, he's arguably the person who really was the first person to put connectivity to use on a landscape and um, his efforts saved the, the Florida panther. And he was the third in this triumvirate 
next slide, please, which includes Dave Foreman. Um, and th those three really were the founders of Wildlands Network. So Dave Foreman came from the world of activism. Um, he was an eco terror, eco, what, he was like the original eco warrior. And um, he's, you know, a fantastically rousing and articulate speaker. And he brought, you know, uh, activism and out there grassroots um, connection to regular people to the science that Reed and Michael were bringing. And that, that was really the birth of Wildlands Network. I, I, um, I'm just thinking about it right now. So I want to mention also that when I started to write about the spine of the continent, one of the first very long conversations I had, and those of you who know him will know exactly how long that was probably, was with Jim Catlin, who is the founder of, of um, Wild Utah. And he, um, I, I mean, he was just a totally generous person with me all along and also you know, just a huge, wonderful influence on my understanding of the issues that go on in the spine of the continent. So the next slide, please. So the uh, whole idea, as you all know, most of you, I think, is that nature needs space and time. And we break up both of those things. So the idea of Wildlands Network uh, had started out as Wildlands Project was to create connection and connectivity and to protect it along the spine of the continent. And sometimes that spine of the continent is referred to as like a biotic conveyor belt because so much wildlife still uses it and moves up and down along along the Rockies. Next slide, please. I, I want to say actually that having that map and having that vision of connectivity, I think is, is one of the main contributions. I mean, the, the very hard work that all of you do to get protections to, for wildlife in so many different ways is hugely important. But we still, you know, we're still trying to understand how to communicate these concepts to people. And I think having a map that shows um, a goal and a, in a physical way is very effective. And um, I still think that vision is really powerful. So this is a, another specimen from the California Academy of Sciences, a mountain lion. And one of the principles, of course, of being supported by the spine of the continent and efforts for connectivity and Wild Utah project is, is to um, tolerate and support the, the needs of the top predator, top predator with a, an outsized role in regulating how the ecosystem works. So on the spine of the continent, that would be wolves, grizzly bears, jaguar, and mountain lions or cougars. And in most places in the US, we still do have cougars, even where the other, other animals have been extirpated. Next slide, please. And then um, beavers. When I wrote <laughs> The Spine of the Continent, beavers really nearly hijacked the whole narrative. I almost, I almost wrote the whole book about beavers because uh, the story of beavers is absolutely fascinating. It really puts together the story of human sovereignty and, and uh, westward expansion and, uh, and biotic life and, and the whole way that beavers, this change the ecosystem and, and they're kind of, a, they're, they're um, just the spectacular species to, to demonstrate um, how coevolution works you know, how the actions and activities and life ways of species influence each other. And with, with beaver, this also has to do with the geology and the hydrology of, of the actual landscape. So we talk about this West that we love so much, this, you know, what we see and what we hike through and meadows and um, beaver. <laughs> uh, so, this is a whole dimension that um, really inspired me. This was when I was on the spine of the continent researching that book. I worked with Mary O'Brien in the Grand Canyon and um, went out with her on several trips. And she's, of course, those of you who know Mary know she is a beaver believer. And uh, she, she got me believing hard in beavers too. And of course, the Wild Utah Project is doing some great beaver work. So I'm really happy about that. Next slide, please. Um, this is a grizzly bear. And 
uh, this is simply, I'm going to stop my first part. I'm going to talk again a little bit later about citizen science. Well, I'm not going to quite stop yet, but <laughs> next slide. This is a really old map of grizzly bear territory. I, I did try to find a better one. I'm constantly looking for better slides, but um, this it really shows that this is where there's suitable habitat for grizzly bears in the, this section of the spine of the continent. And this is focused more on the, the United States, the Canada, uh, Alaska and Canada have more, many more grizzly bears than we do. But it just shows how there's this breakup of where, how those bears in Yellowstone, how can they get to the bears in the Selway Bitterroot um, if we don't protect linkages between them. Next slide, please. And then when I was on the spine of the continent, um, my main huge revelation was, uh, okay, all these people up and down the spine of the continent, the best people in the world doing the best work in the world. And, but when I, when I try to tally up a ledger sheet of how much protection is getting accomplished, how much concrete conservation outcomes can we say that we have done and are doing it's it's not ad, it's not it's not um, commensurate with the effort and it's it's not commensurate with the effort we're putting into it and it's not commensurate with the effort that is needed to protect biodiversity and this is painfully painfully evident every year that we get another number that we can hardly put our minds around about how much bio, biodiversity we continue to lose and this is just continuing unabated and um and so I was thinking, okay, well, what's going on? Is it over or what? And then I went on this project with the Sky Island Alliance, which is a partner on the spine of the continent at the, low, at the southern end. Um, next slide, please. And went to Mexico to learn how to track wildlife. And the, the main idea at that time was to figure out where jaguar were coming into Arizona because they are on the endangered species list and then um, the federal, the government is enjoined with creating crit critical habitat for them, but there's lots and lots of mountain ranges in Arizona, so you can't protect them all. So which ones should you make protect for the jaguar? Well, find out where the jaguar is going. The jaguar knows where it wants to go. So on this particular project, which was called Citizen Tracker, I was in Mexico with people from all different walks of life and different ages and different races. It was it was an incredibly um, diverse group of people, much more diverse than other citizen science projects I'm, I'm usually on. And what um, struck me was number one, they didn't talk about politics because they wouldn't have agreed and they wouldn't have had a good time if they did. So they didn't, but they still made friends with each other over looking for uh, learning how to track. And then next slide, please. When they got back to Tucson, they were, they were given a transect and a transect is just a long piece of land to monitor. And they um, monitored those, those transects and the Sky Island Alliance along with many other partners in Arizona have been successful, oddly, because we don't think of Arizona as the leader in conservation, but in this way they kind of are, in creating highway overpasses and underpasses for wildlife. So I saw a couple of things in that hearing constantly from government officials, natural resource managers, and NGOs that they need two things, more data and more people who care. And then I'm noticing on the spine of the continent in particular that there's a, an impasse in the way people talk about nature that seems to stop all action. So then I saw that this thing, citizen science, could uh, bring all of those things together, provide data, organically enjoin regular people to care and understand and also to provide a, a framework of interest and connection that did not involve politics. And so I said, I'm going to write my next book about citizen science because I think it can really do something. So I'll be back later, but that I'll stop right now. Just a nice picture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary Ellen. That was fabulous background and context for uh, for our work and and for the story um, that we like to tell, and certainly about the spine of the continent. 
Um, so as I mentioned earlier, Wildlands Network was founded on the idea that for conservation of wildlife to be successful, you have to think big, um, in our case, North America big. Uh, Mary Ellen showed you all a map of the Western Wildway or spine of the continent, um, which was a vision, is a vision that's intended to be inspirational to those working in the region. Um, a common goal that can be supported by a million smaller actions, um, everyone working collectively for that shared commons. And our work spans not just the spine of the continent, but as you see from the map in front of you, also wildways along the Pacific coast and then the Eastern seaboard. And today, Wellens Network is really proud to work with many partners in all three countries um, to achieve smaller scale conservation successes that support the larger vision. Um, I think as Mary Ellen alluded to, it can seem overwhelming, um, but we're up against and what we're trying to accomplish. And it's really when you dive down into the very specific projects and the work that smaller groups and, and smaller communities and coalitions are doing on the ground when you start to see the difference that is being made and the possibilities that um, could be taken to scale across the entire continent. Um, one of our first victories as an organization was actually seeing the success of Wild Utah Project, um, which we helped support as the organization took shape and then watched as it grew to support an entire network of conservation actions in Utah. Um, while our staff works on many field research projects across the country, and um, if you want to move to the next slide, um, we don't ourselves manage and maintain volunteers and citizen scientists. Um, instead, we help support and encourage the work of our partners who do so. Um, this photo is from an event we co-hosted in the Arizona borderlands. We worked with partners on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border on a one-day bio blitz, as it's termed. They, they have these that happen sort of across the country, across the continent, um, globally even, in order to capture via the iNaturalist app um, as many species of plants and animals as possible so that we could showcase the amazing biodiversity of that landscape. The Skylands is actually one of the most biodiverse areas in the, in the world. Um, while we use that data to advocate for conservation strategies and design projects, we really would be nowhere without our regional partners that bring out the hundreds of volunteers that help compile and analyze this information. Um, it's truly foundational to the work that we do, and it's amazing, again, to see the types of projects and the, and the work that is going on, not just in the spine of the continent, but really across, um, across the U.S. and in Mexico and in Canada as well. Um, so Mary Ellen, uh, you literally wrote the book on citizen science, and, and I'm just wondering if you can tell us more about um, that book and, and specifically, you know, why you feel so passionately about this issue and um, what, what experiences you found in, in writing that. Thank you so much, Katie. So um, we can go to the next slide or uh, so this is a, I wish this was a better slide too, apologies. This is a, a screenshot from a project that Maya Lin is working on. You might un, uh, remember Maya Lin is the uh, architect and artist who created the Vietnam Memorial. And she has a huge project that she's doing, which is a, you can contribute to it actually, which is an online um, thing to, to um, honor. It's like a memorial for uh, extinct species. And um, it's, this is a heartbreaker. This is a heartbreaker. Like we have to just cry about this. <laughs> it's just, you know, and we can put our feelings about um, animals that we love or have a connection to and honor them as gone. We can hardly even really comprehend what that really means because extinction is really forever. But Let's say we could take Myelin's memorial and turn it into its opposite, which is a map of life, a map of ongoing life that is got a past of uh, generations into the past, um, a creative fabric of life that continues to be woven into the future and of which we're part. And I like to use this image because our individual observations on iNaturalist um, add up to a map that is uh, globally significant to scientists trying to understand what's actually going on with species where. Next slide, please. And um, this is a map that 
is, is part of the monarch migration. You'll see it's the spring and summer map, sort of general directions. We don't know, um, and Katie alluded to the, the monarch earlier, we, we don't know where the whole thing about the monarch migration, we do know that this monarch is in danger of really blinking out, especially the West, there's two populations, there's an East Coast population and a West Coast population. And here in California in the 1980s, 4 million butterflies were counted on their, um, their, migrate, their annual migration. And this last year and the year before, we counted um, under 30,000, well, 30 to 34,000, which is basically at a breaking point for the species. And so one of the good things about the monarch, though, for citizen science is um, we can actually really create habitat for butterflies almost wherever we live and we can help bring back monarch butterflies. The reason we know monarch butterflies are going extinct is because of citizen science. So for decades, people have been counting butterflies every year and like people count birds every year. And then we can look at those numbers every year and see what the pattern is. And then we're just like those people uh, tracking jaguar, People don't even have to talk to each other. They can just go plant milkweed in their backyard or go to their board of supervisors if you live in a city like I do, or go to your town hall and, and um, object to the use of pesticides and herbicides ad infinitum. We can buy organic food when possible. It's more expensive. The thing about organic food is that it, even if the pesticides weren't bad for us and herbicides weren't bad for us, they're bad for insects. So the monarch butterfly has this incredible uh, four to five generation migration over the course of a year. It, nobody knows how they do that because by the fifth generation, the monarchs are going back to the site where their ancestors came from. It would be as though I went back to my great, great, great grandmother's home in Ireland and nobody had to tell me where it was. It, it would be as if I said, okay, I'm going now. And I got on a boat and I went there. Um, really? How would I know that? This to me is a staggering dimension of nature that I don't think we can understand um, with our minds right now. <laughs> but we have to honor it and imagine that someday we'll be able to understand it and to also see that there's there's far more in what nature is doing than we can even measure or observe right now. Um, I, when I used the word cosmic earlier, I mean that, you know, we have to understand that there's, we're charged with a responsibility here that is bigger than what we can see. Next slide, please. Um, and so these, the next couple of slides are some of the, some images of wild Utah projects and are there wildlands networks projects in here too? The other thing that I, I, I am a huge, so my citizen science book is, it's long, kind of too long. Um, and I focused it on California because that's where I live and what a part of being a citizen scientist is knowing where you are. And so what I explained like the bio blitz and um, how ecosystems function and how getting data about citizens, about how biodiversity works contributes to being able to help it. But I want to say that the other hugely important thing I think to do uh, in, in addition to getting images of nature using iNaturalist is restoration work. I mean, I consider any restoration work to be citizen science work because it's on behalf of basically a scientific principle about how to help heal nature in order to, for it to function better. So it's kind of like the, uh, the rehab part of the medical situation. And I do, I, I try to volunteer on a lot of different restoration projects here in San Francisco Bay Area. I always feel incredibly happy doing it. Being outside is, is wonderful. It's a huge antidote to the kind of despair that we can all um, fall prey to when we're, you know, thinking about Oh my God, the world is ending actually. <laughs> um, so we'll go forward with the slides a little. And if I don't know the, some of the details about these slides, uh, uh, if somebody else wants to um, jump in. I really like this slide. This is a wildlife camera. 
and this motion activated camera, it will capture the comings and goings of species as they go by. And this is a this is where where citizens usually help with a camera traps like this is doing what this woman is doing, which is putting them up and, and maintaining them. But also they get thousands and thousands of images and we need human eyes to recognize what species are being collected. There are certain species that we can, certain images that artificial intelligence can get faster than we can, which is great. We wanna use artificial intelligence, but then there's images that only humans can really discern. Um, and here is, I love this so much, this whole wildlife picture index dimension of citizen science, because it's, it's um, revolutionizing what we know about how nature works, because we're seeing animals and moving in a way that we could never see if we were out there, because they don't want to be seen by us, right? There's hilarious, one of the projects I have worked on here is on one Mount Tam. There's saw a hilarious series of pictures where you know, the camera caught hikers going by, and then the next frame was a coyote going behind them. <laughs> so they never knew that a coyote was behind them because the coyotes like didn't want to be seen by them. So would never have known, even if they were biologists, that um, there was a coyote there. So we actually see what animals are doing and when. And this is actually getting to a point where researchers are able to even discern differences and changes in trophic relationships. At um, Jasper Ridge in uh, down the peninsula here, there some scientists have used camera trap data of cougars, but then they've also been able to extract DNA from scat near the, the images and then and then make a, a spreadsheet or whatever they do with their their analysis to show how the diet of how basically how the whole trophic relationship of this reserve has been changing since cougars came back to it. Next slide. So this is, um, this is where we, we have our eyes and we can see. And you know our eyes are the mirror to our soul. But, but there's more out there than we can see with just with our eyes. And citizen science is a way that we create a global biodiversity observation network with our eyes as contributing participants to see a global pictures that otherwise would not be possible to be seen. Now I have tremendous, tremendous um, optimism about what will be possible and what is already possible in addition to satellite data that is taking pictures, in addition to getting genetic analysis of things like soil and scat and microbes. When we start to create really a more, a bigger and more dense picture of really what's going on and also a better understanding. And this is something that I hope that coronavirus will help us grapple with of why and how we need a vibrant, healthy ecosystems for even our own persistence. Because, you know, we're the reason we are unleashing viruses like coronavirus is directly related to destroying habitat for species. So we destroy the habitat species that have co-evolved with viruses for millions of years and um, developed a way to withstand them, uh, the species are gone because we take away their habitat, but the viruses aren't gone. And the viruses just look for another host and they find one in, in um, abundance, us. So we wanna not get another coronavirus, we better stop chopping down habitat willy-nilly. And uh, we got a big problem on our hands because we're trying to feed 7 billion and counting people. And um, we also can see today that we don't know how to function really without the wheels of industry moving. And uh, we're gonna have to figure that out. But we, as we try to figure it out, we need data about really where and when to moderate human activity. And that's really the important thing of citizen science is even if you just go out for a walk and you take 10 pictures of some wildflowers and a tree, you know, scientists are using that and natural resource managers are using that data to, to look at patterns and make observations and then to create arguments with them. So I'll stop there and I'm very happy to respond to questions and comments.
Thanks, Mary Ellen. Um, we do have a couple of questions. I think I'm going to save them if you don't mind until the end. Is that okay? After Mary speaks? Well, it is for me. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, I think, I think hopefully everybody else can wait just a little bit longer because I, I do want to um, give Mary the opportunity to talk specifically about the work that Wild Utah Project does. Um, I mean, Wild Utah Project is really built on collective community action. Uh, you rely on community members to collect data and then actively work in the field to support projects. So can you tell us a little bit more about the projects that you work on and, and how you do, work, do all of that as your organization? Yeah, thank you so much. I, I just also want to take the opportunity to, um, on the behalf of myself and the Wild Utah Project staff, we really appreciate being invited and getting a chance to talk about our community science program. So thanks anybody who's listening in and um, for the partners for uh, putting on this platform. So yeah, Wild Utah Project, a local nonprofit here in Salt Lake City. Um, we are tasked with bringing forth science in service of wildlife conservation. And if we can move to the next slide in response to Katie um, and just kind of putting this into context again for folks who may have joined a little bit late, um, we do have shared roots with the Wildlands Network, of course, as uh, you can see on the far right, uh, Mary Ellen already covered the spine of the continent, this continental corridor here. But you'll notice about halfway down in the middle of that corridor is a purple outlined area aptly named the Heart of the West. And that is primarily where we work at Wild Utah Project. And in the center of this slide, you will see a map that represents habitat areas in yellow. Um, and if you look closely, you can see some ribbons of purple, purple networks or corridors um, that have been modeled, the important connections between those core habitats. And I just, I just want to make this connection for you before we delve into the projects, because it really, um, hopefully, those of you who are interested in community, community science, science or participating in the future kind of empowers you and um, um, ties back that connection to how it's applied to conservation outcomes. So if you can imagine for a moment that you are a planner, say a transportation planner, or maybe you're a wildlife or habitat manager, and you have to make a decision about where to put a wildlife overpass or an underpass, and you only have so many dollars, you only have so many resources and manpower, or maybe you have to decide where to repatriate, where to repopulate a, a native species that's not doing so well. And you have to know where is it going to survive in the landscape if you release it. Or perhaps you only have so many dollars for a restoration project. Um, where are those efforts best spent? Where do you prioritize things like that on the landscape? And if you don't have a tool like the one in front of us that tells us something about wildlife movement and habitat connectivity, it's going to be really challenging to make an informed decision in an objective way, right? And so the community science projects that I'm about to talk about, they gather the landscape level robust data that are required to produce a conservation planning tool like the one you see in front of you. So we can go to the next slide there. And then just a bit about, you know, we heard from Mary Ellen, it feels a little bit overwhelming thinking about the countless species and habitats that of course are conservation worthy and that, you know, should have our attention. So at Wild Utah Project, we really try to think about how to prioritize our time. We are a small group, we have to be effective and efficient with our resources. So what we try to do is bridge this gap between, you know, the ecological questions driven by fundamental principles of conservation biology and the actual conservation tools or strategies that managers need and that they're using on the ground to make their decisions. And often the gap is a data gap. And by that, I mean sometimes just something as simple as a point of information about a sensitive species. Where does it live? Where are its suitable habitats? How is it distributed on the landscape at different times of the year? And then what is the current condition for those habitats? And then once we've identified and kind of agreed upon, this is a crucial data cap, this is the strategy we need it for, 
um, we also have to identify those scientific research tools. Sometimes there are protocols, field methods, analyses already existing in the literature, and they've already been vetted and everybody can agree that we can use those. And sometimes we have to work with, we get to work with our academic partners to develop new um, uh, protocols so that we can measure those data about habitat or species in a, in a robust standardized way. So even once we get that agreed upon point of information we need to fill or data gap we need to fill, what the conservation tools and strategy is and the methods for how to gather that information, um, which takes a lot of time to you know, even get to that stage, we still have an enormous hurdle to clear. And that is often those data about species and habitats that we need to gather are, we're talking about landscape level information. And we're talking about places that sometimes are really challenging to access because they're remote in a wilderness area, or they're challenging to access because it's kind of a network throughout the wild urban interface, as we call it, where we have, you know, neighborhoods and backyards and cemeteries and, um, you know, parks and things like that. And so this, is truly where community science saves the day. It really saves the day. I mean, we could not gather this information without the power of community science. Um, and when I say save the day, I mean, not just for a given project, but in the long run, um, can genuinely gather that information that results in conservation outcomes that means saving the biodiversity that Mary Ellen is referring to. So if we can go to the next slide. So without further ado, we'll jump into um, one of our current conservation programs, uh, sorry, community science conservation programs. So the Stream and Riparian Restoration Project, its focus is really on increasing the resiliency and function and condition, as well as the connectivity of native stream and riparian habitats here in Utah. Um, and of course, we work with partners to do this, right? Depending on the land jurisdiction, we work with the land stewards. Um, we work with groups like Trout Unlimited and the Forest Service and the Utah Division of Natural Resources. Um, but the work, ultimately, there's so much to be done. And um, to get that done, you know, it's, it's very challenging in the arid west to improve waterways. Um, and it's also very challenging to have the resources to go back and monitor those improvements in an objective standardized way, unless we have this army of wonderful people who are ready to participate not only in the field, but also to do some training, um, you know, some classroom exercises to get to the point where they can help us go out there and assess pre and post restoration conditions. So if you can go to the next slide. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, we have here folks actively putting in a beaver dam analog. Um, and this is such a fun way to participate in community science. It sounds like Mary Ellen maybe has experienced this firsthand, but um, it's, there's immediate gratification when you're out there and you start building the dam, you see the water level rise, you see the flow of the water slow. Um, if you come back even a short time after, you see the footprint of the water grow on the landscape. And importantly, the duration of the water that's available on the landscape throughout the season is longer as well. And so I, I can't even name all the um, uh, positive ecological impacts, but just to rattle off a few, you get to see the return of native plants, uh, native plant species, trout, um, all sorts of native fish really. Uh, insect availability goes up. It makes it a better habitat corridor for bats. Um, you also have, you know, migratory birds with better habitat there. Um, all sorts of uh, improvements that happen in a fairly short time after you do this. And you really see an increased aquatic habitat connectivity, uh, particularly if you can set up a series of these beaver dam analogs within a watershed. So this is really exciting work, again, that um, could not be done at the scale it's being done without our partnerships, but importantly, without those community scientists. And the next, next slide. So up next, we have our amphibian and habitat assessments. And this is a project we do primarily in partnership with Utah Hobel Zoo. 
Um, but we also work closely with the Division of Wildlife Resources here in Utah, the Forest Service, and the Utah Geologic Survey. Um, and the focus of this project really is filling one of those seemingly simple data gaps, right? Where is the species, right? We have in particular a sensitive species in Utah, the boreal toad. Um, where is it? Where is its habitat distributed? What is the condition of that habitat? Where are the crucial habitats during the breeding season, right? So this sort of information is um, the, the, the kind of information that is really crucial for managers to have. And, you know, the community scientists who participate in this project, they also receive a formal training and they have two options to participate. They can go out in the field on a field trip with scientists and learn how to do assessments of boreal toads. They can also sign up to steward a, a site themselves. So they can go out on their own schedule and kind of take ownership of this place and visit it multiple times and try to increase the chances of seeing um, different stages of boreal toads. If you can go to that next slide. Um, so some of the, the outcomes for gathering these data our partners at Utah Geological Survey have produced these maps. And on the right, you can see some color-coded dots, which represent uh, different locations for breeding habitat and habitats that maybe historically had breeding, but didn't that year. Um, and then all of these areas also had a habitat assessment done for them. So if you see that image on the left-hand side, this is a habitat model, which took those uh, citizen science gathered data and developed this tool, right? So this is another one of those planning tools. You can see the gradient of dark to light uh, blue. The darker blue sections represent the highest suitability areas for boreal toads. And I have a really exciting um, conservation outcome to share. Uh, folks at the Denver Zoo and the Hobel Zoo, they captively rear boreal toads. And the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources use data like these to decide where the best places to repatriate or reintroduce those little toadlets that were reared in captivity would be based on habitat suitability data like this. Um, and then other decisions that are made based off of these uh, community science gathered data, you know, where are the locations where um, beaver dam analogs, different types of restoration, a beaver dam analog is one example from last year as well as some cattle fencing that excludes cattle from really priority breeding habitats um, at certain times of year. Uh, those, you know, those things take a lot of money, they take resources, they take planning, they take man hours, and um, it's really hard as a decision maker or a wildlife or habitat manager to make those uh, calls without some baseline data like these. So if you can go to the next slide. Okay, up next is our Utah pollinator pursuit, as we are calling it. And this year we're really focused on putting native pollinator species on the map, as we say, through community science. And I don't need to belabor the point, but um, there should be little down arrows by those percentages. The monarch butterfly, at least the Western population, down by 99%, um, which kind of parallels the stats that Mary Ellen shared earlier. And then the Western bumblebee in particular down by 41%. So community scientists with this project can use an application on their phone. And with our partners at the Utah Geologic Survey, as well as the Division of Wildlife Resources and Utah State University, we've developed this survey protocol that is really accessible to community scientists. So it's similar to the iNaturalist that you saw, except it directly feeds into, um, if you can go to the next slide, it directly feeds into the state database. So this slide's a little bit busy, I apologize, but if you focus on those two maps in the background, you can see one for the monarch butterfly, one for the Western bumblebee, and we've circled some areas where we're starting to understand you know, where those networks of movement might be particularly crucial for monarch butterfly because they're suitable milkweed habitat, for example, or some other attributes that community scientists uh, gather about the, the habitat. So, you know, nectar resources, not just milkweed, but other nectar resources are important for both the monarch and the western bumblebee as well. So Utah is really trying to do its part with the pollinator pursuit to 
put these pollinators on the map. And right now we're starting with these two um, for this field season, these two species. Um, and our community scientists are, have just been phenomenal already. We had a web training that was very well attended, something people can do while social distancing. And again, just different levels of involvement with this project. They can just take a survey anytime they see one of these species or even one that looks like them, that's okay too. And um, they can also take stewardship over a site by going out multiple times a year to particular priority areas. Um, so the next slide. And then the last project that I'm gonna talk about, um, somebody stop me if we need to wrap up, I'll look for gestures. <laughs> um, but the Wasatch Wildlife Watch is the last one I'll talk about. So hopefully we can get plenty of time for folks questions. Um, so I was glad to see Mary Ellen explain that slide with the community scientists setting up the motion trail camera. So that is what we have a, an army of people doing out here in the central Wasatch, all the way from uh, the more urban areas as far west as the Jordan River, all the way up into wilderness areas in the, um, in the Wasatch Mountains. And what we're really focused on is getting a better understanding of habitat use along the wild urban interface. And when we say wild urban interface, we're really we're talking about that gradient of anthropogenic disturbance or different uses, human uses across that landscape and how that affects wildlife movement. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, and I think, you know, it kind of goes without saying, it's not just development, it's uh, not just, you know, the way maybe we change vegetation communities and we create transportation corridors, but also we have an enormous amount of recreation happening in the Wasatch and it's just growing every year. The latest statistic that I saw is it's um, the number of visitors recreating in the central Wasatch range is akin to the number of visitors annually to all five national parks, if you can believe that. So um, with that rapid increase, you know, we've got our questions about how is this affecting the movement of large um, and medium sized mammals as well as um, you know, use of waterways and things like that. So how does it affect connectivity from a wildlife and watershed perspective? And so the next slide. This is just an image um, to represent, these different colored polygons represent that gradient of anthropogenic use. So um, a pretty stark uh, difference um, in this gradient as you move from west to east um, up to the mountains there. So that's kind of the, the wild urban interface that we're talking about. Next. And then the community science data gathered with these trail cameras. It's an enormous lift. There's no way we could cover the, you know, seven canyons as well as the urban areas in the foothills of the canyons uh, without this army of community scientists. This is an example of a data output from these. So this is one of those mapping products that we've worked with, um, in particular, the University of Utah's Biodiversity and Conservation Ecology Lab, and in particular, a PhD candidate, um, Austin Green. Um, so he has uh, worked with us to generate this heat map, essentially, for habitat use. And this is just the example of one canyon. If we can go to the next slide, you can imagine how valuable having that heat map, having that baseline data would be if you can have it for an entire planning area. So this image is a potential future scenario that has come out of a process called the Mountain Accord. I can, I'll leave that to you to look that up. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a potential future where we have all of these connections through the Wasatch Front, um, these seven parallel canyons, we have ski resorts, we have all kinds of recreation opportunities, um, and there, our transportation solutions are needed with all this increased recreation. And so planning decisions like these are happening all the time, and often in the absence of up-to-date information about how wildlife are using the landscape. So wouldn't it be nice if we have these robust data sets, this heat map of habitat use, a better handle on core habitats, where important connections and pinch points are for wildlife so that transportation planners can say, 
you know, in an objective way that we need to prioritize overpasses and underpasses here and not fragment this area further because of, you know, seasonal migrations or what have you. So next slide. So I just want to kind of wrap this up and tie back to the slide that we showed in the beginning. Another, this is, a, you know, again, a planning tool that we wish we had yesterday for the central Wasatch, for example, and in so many places in North America. If we have an objective way of understanding where important corridors could be or currently are or how they could be improved for wildlife, we'd just be in such better shape for making those planning decisions. And, um, you know, that's really the niche that Wild Detail Project uh, fills. We try to bridge that uh, relate those relationships with academicians who, you know, have those standardized methods and vetted protocols to um, the conservation planners and the decision makers, the habitat managers, um, and ultimately, we can't help gather those data and fill those large data gaps without, if you can go to the next slide, our partners, of course, which I've mentioned, and next slide, ultimately without our amazing community science volunteers, right? You guys, um, I hope we have some of you listening who are participate in some of our projects. Community scientists are the lifeblood life of these projects. We could not do it without them. They are just a force. Um, next slide. Mary Ellen touched on this. Anybody can be a community scientist, right? All walks of life, families who are just wildlife and outdoor enthusiasts, um, people who are educators and students, expert naturalists, backcountry hunters and anglers, you know, anybody can be a community scientist. There are all sorts of levels of involvement. There's, there's something out there for everybody who's willing to be a part of that solution. Next slide. Uh, I'd just be remiss if I didn't include a couple fun pictures from the Wildlife Watch. So this is one of my favorites, a moose observing a mountain biker. Next. <laughs> And not one, not two, but three mountain lions on a trail that I frequently run at dusk, which is really fun. Never see them, by the way. <laughs> Next one. So if you or you know someone who might be interested in participating in one of our community science programs, um, you can just go to wilddetailproject.org and we have a projects tab at the top. Uh, we have a page for the current field season. If you scroll down that page, it's really easy. You'll see a quick description of each of the projects I described and some others. And there's a join button or a sign up button. And you'll get an email that tells you about you know, how to engage and your different options for participating in each project. Uh, so with that, I think we just have an uh, information slide. And um, again, thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I love hearing about those projects and the work that you all do. I think it's it's so inspiring um, how much you are able to manage with such a small organization and a small staff. A small staff, and again, that just speaks to the the efforts and the contributions of all your volunteers. Um, and I want to thank everybody for um, for again for joining into the webinar and. Uh, I know just speaking on behalf of Wildlands Network, we are so excited to um, do more work with Wild Utah Project moving forward, um, specifically since we, as I alluded to earlier, um, just recently moved our headquarters to Salt Lake City and in, into Utah and look forward to doing a lot more work in the state. So this is a very exciting opportunity for us as well. Um, so let's turn to the questions and answers. Um, so just if you pull up the Q&A box, that's where you can put in questions. If you have just general comments, you're welcome to submit those as well and you can use the chat feature as well. So I'll just be running through these um, and answering them or handing them off to others to answer. Um, the first question here we had from Joe Donaldson, um, specifically for Mary Ellen, uh, regarding Maya Lin's memorial to extinct species, do you know where it will be, when it's expected to be built and who is funding it? I haven't looked uh, at it live for a while, but it used to just be online. You could find it yourself called like what's missing. Look at her website. Um, but I do know that she recently received big funding and I'm not going to remember from where, but, um, oh, I think it was National Geographic yeah. to, um, to address this project in particular. 
So I don't know what she has planned for how she's bolstering it, but she's brought her attention to it again. So, you know, she's a really busy lady doing huge projects all over the world and she's a, an incredible artist. So she's, it's good news that she's bringing her attention back to this project. Um, but I think it might be right up there already. I think it's called What's Missing, but you can probably find it on her website. Perfect, thank you. Um, the second question that Joe had um, is more for me. Um, you showed a great overview map of the three primary wildway corridors in North America. Realizing the diagram was very general, these appear to be land-based for terrestrial movement. Is the Wellands Network also looking at these in association with flyways for birds, insects, and bats? Um, so yes, it, I will say historically, um, and even still today, much of our mapping and analysis work has really um, been biased towards terrestrial mammals. Um, a lot of our history was looking at um, large uh, animals that required large landscape movement um, on a terrestrial, terrestrially, including carnivores, many of whom Mary Ellen mentioned, as well as other um, large ungulate species in particular. So, but we are in the process of looking at more of that information. There's been work done by Audubon and other organizations specifically looking at different flyways and including projected migration and movement patterns in light of climate change. That's really fascinating. Um, some of the maps that have been put together, some of the interactive maps are really cool to look at um, and show the entire continent and, and sort of projected movement across the continent. So it's work that we are very interested in and we um, look forward to working with more partners and incorporating that data and information as we move forward, both in the projects on the ground that we work on, but also at the policy level in looking at ways to support conservation specifically for avian species um, with their unique needs. And again, they're in some many cases, um, the greatest examples of uh, species that require land, habitat, uh, water resources across the entire continent. So it's really critical that we consider them moving forward. Um, we have the next question um, from Patrick Shea, uh, I think directed to Mary and Mal Mary Ellen uh, and whoever else would like to answer. Um, the environmental community, whether they are focused on conservation or preservation, are fractured and all too often competing or conflicting for the same limited dollars. How can we bring some unity, coherence, and prioritization to our environmental community? Well, my response um, is we can't, um, we shouldn't focus too much on trying to fix, quote unquote, kind of how NGOs work. Um, what we need to do, I think, is get a whole lot more people involved in what they do. And, you know, Mary's, Mary, I love Mary's presentation. That was so fabulous. And think about all those people that are doing that work. You know, they're not just doing that work, right? Because they already, they know now. They go home to their communities and they know something. And if we had more and more of those people knowing something about what's happening, then we'll see, I wanna see a big burgeoning new, it's, it, we don't need more NGOs, but we need all of them to be bigger. We need all of them to have more people in them. You know, but just like we're doing this, all this amazing kind of um, remote connecting with each other through Zoom because of the coronavirus, this is something that citizen science allows us to do, right? Which is to stay in touch with and cultivate vast networks of people virtually without having to have the bricks and mortar. Although I think that's always a really great thing. And I think citizen science will, will in places where library systems are doing citizen science, I think you see a big uptick in its effectiveness um, because people can meet together to do, you know, to just go over their results and to have a party and to share bread and, you know, liquids. <laughs> So I think we do need bricks and mortar, but instead of, you know, the, the, all these places are starved for resources, God bless them. Um, some of them are dysfunctional, God bless them. Uh, we need to add more to them. And I want more people who say they care about nature to actually do something. <laughs> Mary, what do you think? Oh yeah, I mean, that sounds wonderful. I just, um... Yeah, to Patrick's question, um, 
the he, he, I think he's describing like the the distinction between people who are really just focused on preservation versus conservation. And in my mind, um, you know, hopefully those folks are all working together. In some ways, um, I associate people who are solely focused on preservation. Um, I associate that with like land uh, use change and policy and um, it can be like very partisan in some ways, right? Whereas I associate conservation action and particularly conservation action that's inclusive where we partner with state and federal agencies, we partner with academia, we partner with um, other nonprofits, right? It's, it's inclusive. Anybody who's, you know, bringing something to the table and has that shared mission, um, you know, is, is kind of working together. And so I would just say maybe that's kind of on us doing conservation action to try and bring those folks who are super preservation, land preservation focused um, into the fold and, and just, we all just need to kind of play in the same sandbox and figure out how to work together. Yeah, thank you both. I just wanted to follow up to just a little bit of perspective. Um, I, this issue comes up quite a bit. And uh, just to echo what Mary was saying, I think creating inclusive partnerships and um, really looking at community level and, and we talk about large landscape conservation, we really, it takes a whole bunch of folks bringing a whole bunch of different skill sets um, in order to effectively do that. And uh, we're working with Wild Utah Project right now on a um, sort of statewide initiative looking at connectivity um, just in the early stages of building this out, but it's really focused on inclusive um, community building and engagement and, and bringing different voices to the table and then hopefully finding shared goals and, and common ground to move ideas forward. Um, we also, both Mary and I are very fortunate, um, our organizations have support from some funders who understand the bigger picture and understand that uh, there's many different NGOs that need to be uh, involved in projects at, at the scale we're talking about in order to be successful and have really um, tried to, I think those funders are working to change the dynamic around um, sustainable funding for organizations and, and helping to leverage and spread resources so that there can be support for a number of groups working collectively versus sort of fighting over the same pot of money. Um, so that, that has been really important to our work. Um, as well. And um, anyway, I just see a lot of potential here. And I think, as uh, Mary Ellen mentioned as well, there, you know, one of the other realities is that um, the pool of existing funders and some of the big ones in conservation is, is fairly small. But we're seeing a couple things. One is the generational wealth transfer that's happening across the country. And the second, I think, is just a, a growing awareness from people um, across the continent globally about the importance of conservation and how it really ties into um, everything that goes on in the world, including things like this pandemic that we're experiencing right now. And I think that type of understanding and us speaking to the importance of conservation in those contexts can help drive some additional funding and some additional um, sort of general support from communities for this work. So hopefully we'll have just more robust funding, sustainable funding moving forward. And I will stand off my soapbox now. <laughs> so um, the next question on here is uh, from Hillel Brandis. Um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, and it, it's just a comment. It looks like much of the Wasatch isn't part of the Western Wildway Network. Um, I will just note there's, again, some historic reasons behind some of the mapping that was done um, and, and where they drew boundaries. Um, which was, you know, not, I wasn't necessarily a part of, but there were reasons behind that initially. But in theory, everything that was included in the in the broad boundaries of the map that Mary Ellen showed is really truly part of, of the Western Wildway. And those boundaries even themselves are a little ar arbitrary in the sense that there's connections going east-west as well and connections between many other um, smaller regional corridors. So that's really just a, a sort of historic um, mapping uh, issue that we are continuing to evolve the, the maps and the, and the resources we have to communicate the vision. Well, and I, I think I might have um, encouraged that confusion a bit because the, I did show one example of a habitat mapping effort that 
does doesn't include the Wasatch, but there are portions of the Wild Way map that include the heart of the West as kind of a broader polygon, and it does include the Wasatch. So it's just kind of you know there's different generations of um, of mapping going on. Yeah. Any other questions? I also see a comment from Amanda. Um, just one idea to help prioritize and provide coherence is to consider existing legal bases for building connectivity. This may help identify opportunities to leverage funding for multiple goals. Um, and I did, I clicked through to the link and it specifically is looking at um, legal authority for terrestrial conservation corridors along streams. Um, so riparian conservation. And I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of existing programs and frameworks that are set up. And um, one of the, the things that Wildlands Network tries to do is um, help support local partners in identifying those opportunities and, and sort of understanding the, the policy and legal components of this work. Um, but I think you're right, there's a lot of existing law and policy that um, is useful and beneficial. And I'm sure, Mary, in your work, um, again, with the work you do with agencies, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of landscape to cover and a lot of potential for projects and some of it just comes down to funding. Absolutely. And we have another question from David Weckler. Um, seems like the most powerful citizen engagement is of people and the interests who they represent on the ground where nature is. Many people who live in and near wild places may be of apparently very different political views, yet seemingly share some values for keeping wildlands healthy. What have you learned about bringing people of polarized politics together to act on behalf of healthy wildlands? Um, and Mary, I thought I'd just throw that one to you first um, since you spoke to that a little bit. Yeah, you know, um, it's actually really just echoing the story Mary Ellen shared earlier where you have people just on the ground looking for scat and tracks together. And that was what it was about, right? It was that shared experience. And that is the same thing we see um, the politics don't come up and, you know, to the extent that maybe we at Wild Utah Project um, run our trainings, you know, it's just not, it's just not part of our focus, right? As scientists, we're trying to be objective, we're trying to use these tools, um, the, the principles of conservation biology and ecology uh, to answer some questions so that more informed decisions can be made. And you know, the, we, we keep the politics out of it. And because of that, we get it partially, I think because of that, but also of course, because of that shared mission, you know, it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on. If you like to be outdoors, you have a passion about wildlife um, and you wanna be part of, you know, a solution that gets us more information about those things. You know, it doesn't really matter who you voted for. I, I, um, I'm writing a book right now about butterflies. And one of the reasons I'm doing that is because butterflies are really non-controversial, uh, especially in the Intermountain West, in the spine of the continent, the Western Wild Way, you have a starker um, bifurcation of perspectives. Where I live in the Bay Area, we, we have that range of perspectives. We have a lot of rangeland. We have a lot of ranchers and farmers but um, we don't have the same black and white, red versus blue tension quite often. Um, it's just a different dialogue. But the thing is that like the top predators have a historic charge for historic generations of people in the West, if they're, especially if they're ranchers. And then of course, hunters wanna hunt elk. Um, and, so if you, if you get into talking about those animals, you're gonna get into politics. And yet if you protect enough habitat for monarchs, hopefully, and other butterflies, then, and if, you can, if, if we can get across the concepts of what it takes to support any species, it, it reverberates through the whole ecosystem and you do need the top predator. It's one way to understand how the top predator helps your butterflies. So I'm constantly thinking about how to get people, how to get people to understand um, nature without doing it through the lens of politics or 
even just pure economics because it's poised against biodiversity. Economics is poised against biodiversity right now. And we need to change that. It's going to have to be changed anyway if we want to persist. So it's, um, it's a tough, tough nut, but it's a really, really important one. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I think we'll, um, I don't see any more questions and uh, just in the interest of time, I wanna uh, wrap up here. So um, Mary Ellen, I just thought, um, I know in, in the past you've talked about even though we're facing so much and it can be overwhelming, that there's still good news, that there's still reason to be optimistic. And I just thought on that note, maybe you can leave us with sort of a final thought to take away from this webinar. Um, as we walk away from this webinar and also I think many of us starting to like think about re-engaging with the world at large. So any final thoughts for us? Well, I guess really the main thing is that you and me, each of us individually, we are connected and what we do really does matter. I've had a great experience in, the, in recent um, days where two years ago I went and helped move some varied checkerspot caterpillars into the Presidio because a wildlife ecologist who works there thought that they've been restoring habitat there, that the, the habitat was perhaps restored enough that it could support some, some of these butterflies. And I, I saw like 15 varied butterfly checkerspots two days ago. Today is rainy here. If you build it, they will come, right? If you restore the landscape and you know, you know, with the kind of data that Mary is collecting, like where are the places where these species live and thrive and how can we, you know, plant the right things for them, protect, protect the right um, processes for them, they do thrive. And um, I was looking at those butterflies thinking, you know, you, you're here partly because of me. And, and you made me know that what I do matters. And it made me very happy. I think that's a wonderful thought to leave us with. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who participated, um, all the questions, um, all of our panelists. And I just wanna encourage everyone stay connected. Um, feel free to reach out to us if you have other questions or you wanna learn more about any of the projects that were discussed this evening and um, be well and thank you. Thanks gals, that was super fun. Talk to you soon. <laughs> <laughs>